Before I begin my message this morning, I did have something that I wanted to read for you. It was something that I, something that I wrote, uh, I wrote while I was on my lunch break Friday afternoon. I hope that, uh, I hope that this is appropriate, and uh, I hope that I don't generate a lot of controversy. Of course, I hope that, uh, well, at least think about what I, what I wrote here. I'll just go ahead and read it for you. Um, on the morning of March 21st, 2014, Fred Phelps passed away. In case you don't know who he was, Phelps was the founding pastor of the Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas who probably did more to sabotage the gospel of the kingdom of God than anyone that I can think of in the last 50 years. Phelps, Phelps was the man who led protests at the funerals of our fallen soldiers saying that we were judged by God with war and the debts of our soldiers because of our blatant acceptance of sin. He did so, however, with a lot of condemnation and hatred, to be blatantly honest, and it's, very, it's hard to say how many lives he has touched for the worse. And according to the reports I heard, he was also a very violent man who abused his wife and children. It is very difficult for me to come to the conclusion that he was saved by the blood of Jesus. I realize I'm making a strong statement, and I do not do so lightly. But I come to that conclusion not because of the politically correct society in which we live, which wants to celebrate the deaths of men like him, but because of what Scripture teaches. Phelps, as far as I am aware, did not exhibit much, if any, of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul said in Romans 8 that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And combine that with Paul's strong words about a man who doesn't take care of his family being worse than an unbeliever, and it's extremely difficult, if not virtually impossible, to believe that when the day of judgment comes on all men, that Jesus will look at Phelps and say, well done, good and faithful servant. However, I do not in any way try to stand in the judgment seat of God, so I'm not going to be completely dogmatic on this. And furthermore, I hope that I'm wrong. This leads me to one of the, the, the main points of what I want to say, and what I'm about to say will most certainly earn me the hatred and enmity of the world, because I can almost 100% guarantee that the world right now is celebrating and dancing at the news that Fred Phelps is dead. I will wager that the same hatred that was in Phelps' life will be shown all over our nation in the, in the things that will be said about him. Because of this, the world will hate what I'm about to say, which is this. I am saddened and sorrowed over the fact that Fred Phelps is dead. Now, why would I say this? Why, given the evil that he did, would I ever say anything like this? The reason is simple, because whether the world chooses to accept this or not, the fact is that Fred Phelps was a human being made in the image of God who was loved by God so much that he allowed his son to die for him. No matter how wicked he was, Phelps was a child of God who made the deliberate choice to go away from what God wanted him for him in his life. I don't think anyone can deny this. And now that child of God is gone, never to live in this life again, and all hopes of repentance and turning to the Lord God in faith that he would receive the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ is gone. Most likely he is lost forever. I'm reminded of at least four different passages, two in the Old Testament and two in the New Testament, which reflect the love of God for wayward sinners, and that God is not a God who takes pleasure or joy in their death. Ezekiel 18 has two of those verses, uh, verses 23 and 31 through 32, where it says that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but instead he is pleased when a wicked man turns from his wickedness and turns to God in repentance. Ezekiel 33, 11 also says the same thing. God is telling people to repent and live. In addition, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2.4 that God is a God who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.9 that God is a, not a God who wants anyone to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of the truth. The world doesn't understand this, however. The world doesn't have a care for anyone unless that person conforms to what the world considers to be good. Break the world standards and it will absolutely despise you and hate you to the point where it will celebrate when you die. Apologize for being long here. I promise I'll wrap up. In so many ways, the world reminds me of the attitude of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was a man who absolutely hated the people of Nineveh. There would have been little that would have pleased him more 
that would have pleased Jonah more than to see the Nineveh, the, 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 than to see the city of Nineveh, which was a bitter enemy of Israel, blown out of the water. And yet, what happened when that news of judgment came on the people of Nineveh? The people, even the king, called for a day of repentance, dressing in sackcloth and ashes. Perhaps, just perhaps, the king said, God will relent and not bring this disaster upon us. And God did, in fact, relent. The book of Jonah even says that God had compassion on the people of Nineveh. If God would have the same attitude as Jonah, Nineveh would have been blasted away. But God had a great concern for that city and for the people that lived there, didn't he? A pagan city that worshipped other gods and did all kinds of abhorrent things was loved by God. I wonder to myself, do we have the same concern for people? When we see someone who is lost and without God pass away, do we think the same way that the world does? Or do we look at people in the same way that our Father in heaven looks at people, with a desire that they come to repentance so that they will live, both here and in the future kingdom of God? Do we pray for our enemies? Do we try to show compassion and mercy on those who hate us and despise us? I think these are questions that all of us, myself included, need to consider. Fred Phelps was a man who was dedicated to his cause, much as Queen Jezebel was dedicated to the cause of her idols. But the problem is, is that he was dedicated to a completely wrong cause, just as Jezebel was. She was a woman who sought to eliminate the worship of the true God by killing his prophets. And Phelps was a man who sought to eliminate the holiness and love of God by killing the credibility of his followers. Phelps, like Jezebel, is a perfect example of when you see someone who disregards the biblical warning that, quote, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way, end quote. That's Proverbs 19.2. Being excited and zealous for a cause is dangerous if we do not understand what, what that cause is and whether it is one that is worth it in God's economy. If Phelps would have understood this, perhaps a lot of harm could have been avoided. What Phelps did was something that didn't have to happen. The harm that Phelps did to the kingdom of God was not necessary. Phelps could have gotten the message across that sin is not something that should be tolerated and that there is freedom from any sin through, through repentance and placing one faith in Christ Jesus without all the controversy and the hatred. Yet regardless of whether it could have been avoided or not, it did. Phelps did what, we, what he did and there is no way we can go back in time and change that. It genuinely makes me sad that this happened, not only because we have seen the last of Fred Phelps, a man made in the image of God, but also because of the people who have likely been turned off once and for all to the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ because of what he said and he did. Again, I must once again state that I'm not trying to turn Phelps into a sympathetic character. What he did was inexcusable. To be blunt, I am glad that the evil that he did is buried with him, even if, unfortunately, there will be others that will continue it. And yet when I think of Phelps, I cannot help but think of what I believe are the saddest words spoken in the New Testament when the apostles, in speaking of Judas Iscariot, said that he left this ministry to go where he belongs. Acts 1.25. Why would anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ rejoice at the death of anyone when God wants to see them repent and turn to him, no matter what it was he did in this life? He said, you're more than welcome to disagree with me, or maybe you share the same sentiments. But I really felt like, and I apologize for taking so much of your time in saying that, but I really did feel like we had to say that, that I had to say that, and I, I hope it was appropriate. Uh, and so with that, please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're actually going to spend the majority of our time in Hebrews chapter 11, but I would like to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'd like to read verses 26 through 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. The word of the Lord says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
as I'm sure all of you in here know, and I don't think I've ever really made very much mention of this in the seven and a half years I've been here, but um, one of my favorite comedy acts of all time, of course, is Mo, Larry, and Curly, the Three Stooges. Anybody in here a fellow Stooge fan like me? There's nobody, okay, we have a handful. Anybody here absolutely hate and despise the Stooges? It's okay if you do, okay, that's fine if you do. You know, their humor is right up my alley. I don't find very many things that are funnier in life than watching Mo, Larry, and Curly just pound each other, slap each other, and some of the comments that they make and their facial expressions and so on. And, you know, one major aspect of the Stooges is just how they mess everything up. Of course, sometimes they end up succeeding in what they're trying to do, and sometimes they blow it and make it a whole lot worse. But you know, while I was thinking about this, this is probably about a month ago that I was thinking about this. I was actually watching one of my favorite Stooge episodes, and I, it suddenly occurred to me another reason why I'm a Stooge fan. Leaving aside their style of humor, it's also because there is a part of me that relates to them. There is a part of me that relates to them because I have seen myself bumble and stumble through life like a complete screw-up, just like the Stooges. It gives me hope, actually, because how much worse could I do than them? Of course, I say that with the realization that stupidity has no limits, but nevertheless, they do, uh, they do give me a little bit of hope. And you know, sometimes they did succeed at what they, do, what they did. I mean, they, they, didn't, uh, you know, they didn't always have to run from the law. Sometimes they bagged the bad guy and got the girl, as they say. And you know, the Bible is a book that is filled with all kinds of screw-ups. Please turn with me to Hebrews 11. We're gonna, Brother Tom's been giving a series of messages on some of the folks out of Hebrews chapter 11. But I want to do a little bit of an overview on those that are mentioned in here. You know, if sin was something that we could laugh at, the characters in the Bible would probably remind you a lot of the Three Stooges. Of course, sin is far, far more serious and gratefully, uh, God's grace is far greater than the solutions that Moe, and Curley tried to put forward. You know, look at the way that the Bible portrays people. Have you ever considered for a moment that the accounts in the Bible can be on the same level as a soap opera? The late movie director Cecil B. DeMille once said that if you can give me any two pages of the Bible, and I'll get you a movie. And I think he's right there. Because the Bible is filled with every sin that you can possibly think of. Murder, sexual perversity, lying, swindling, theft, ignorance, rejection of God, worship of idols, blaspheming the name of God, government oppression, corruption, family neglect and covetousness. You name it, it most likely is there. And yet, how does the Bible portray some of those about which it is written? God considers them to be saints and workers of his will. Now, obviously, we don't know everything about these men and women that are in Scripture, especially those in the proverbial hall of faith. A lot of people call the, the Hebrews 11 the hall of faith, very much like there's a hall of fame. They kind of consider these guys to be the, this is kind of the hall of fame of faith, for lack of a better way to put it, that some people have put forward. And we know a fair amount of them, but we don't know a ton about them, but we know enough that, we can come to an objective conclusion. Abel and Enoch, for example, are, for example, are mentioned in verses 4 through 6. Now, we don't know very much about them, but we do know that they were still sinners and, do, and they were wrongdoers. Abel, for example, did have to offer a sacrifice, which would imply what? That he brought an offering to get God's forgiveness. Noah, in verse 7, we know a lot about Noah in the ark, but Noah was a drunkard after he... After the flood occurred, he proceeded to plant a vineyard and drank a bunch of his wine and got, and got loaded. He was a drunkard. Abraham, verses 8 through 10, as well as mentioned in verse 17. Here's a man who, when you read the account of Abraham, he was a liar, a coward, he was a swindler, and he was a man who thought that he could do things, he could do God's will his way. Long before Frank Sinatra ever came along, he did it my way. Sarah, the wife of Abraham in verse 11, 
she laughed at God and didn't believe his promise about, not, about having a child in her old age. She was also a woman who was very harsh toward her servant Hagar and unmerciful towards Hagar's son Ishmael. Isaac in verse 20. Isaac was a man who was easily fooled and gullible and didn't check his facts before doing something, giving his blessing to the wrong son. Plus, he, like his father, was also a liar and even a bit of a coward, like father, like son. Jacob, in verse 21, he was a swindler and a con artist of the first degree, who, if you ever read, if you've read carefully the account of Jacob in his old age, you get the impression he's a bit of a crybaby. Like his father, he too didn't check the facts about his son Joseph. And Joseph, verse 22, Joseph was likely a spoiled, rotten brat. He might also, now I, I want to underscore the word might here, he might have been a little bit vindictive at the very least toward his brothers when they came to buy food from him. That's kind of inconclusive. I've heard arguments on both sides, but it's something you have to consider as well. Moses, in verse 23 through 29, he was a man who had a quick temper. He was a murderer and a man who jumped before he looked. He set himself on the same level as God rather than as a servant of God. You can read that in Numbers chapter 20. That was the sin that ended up keeping him out of the promised land. Granted, he did, a fair, he did this out of frustration, but nonetheless, still did so. Rahab, in verse 31, a prostitute. Gideon, in verse 32, Gideon was a vicious man who led Israel into idol worship. He wasn't a humble man, but he saw, instead he saw his troubles as not being his problem. If you looked, if you ever uh, read the account of Gideon in Judges, I want to say it's in Judges chapters 6 and 7. You know, the words that he spoke to the messenger of God, he wasn't necessarily trying to be humble. What he was saying was is that since he is part of the lowest family in the lowest tribe, it wasn't his problem. Let the big dogs in Israel take care of the big problem that's going on. I've read, for example, that in societies like ancient Israel, that the scope of the problem was handled by the prominent. I mean, if you had a, if you had a big problem, the important people took care of it. If it was a smaller problem, then lesser people took care of it. You know, has anybody in here ever said, that's not my problem? I think all of us have. That's what Gideon was effectively saying. Leave me out of it, angel. Let the leaders take care of it. Not me. I'm just a low life. I don't, I'm, I'm not qualified. Barak, in verse 32, a man of little faith, didn't trust the words of God through the prophetess Deborah. Samson, oh boy, where do you start with this guy? Samson was a man full of lust for women and a disregarder of the vow that he took before God. Um, the details of the Nazarite, how many of you in here have heard of the Nazarite vow? Handful of you, okay. Basically, the Nazarite vow was a special vow to God, and during that time, you were not to drink any fermented drinks of any kind, wine, wine vinegar, etc. You weren't to touch grapes or raisins. You were not to shave your, to cut your hair in any way, shape, or form, and you were not allowed to touch a dead body, even if it was the body of your own father or mother. Now, what did Samson do? <laughs> well, he drank wine freely. He touched the, a body, the, the dead body of a lion and freely allowed a razor to shave his head, to, to shave his head of his hair. And even if you read at the end of Samson's life, when he prayed, that God's spirit would come on him one more time. He didn't pray that he wanted to do this to the Philistines in order for God to get glory. He did it because he wanted to get revenge on the Philistines for taking out his two eyes. Jephthah. Boy, there, there's another one, verse 32. A violent man who had no qualms about making a rash and stupid vow that ended up costing him the life of his daughter. David, verse 32. Now, where do you start with him? I talked about in the past. Just in the sin that he committed with Bathsheba, he broke all ten of the commandments. He was a violent man who married multiple women, decided to kill another man for his wife. He was a terrible father and a lousy disciplinarian of his kids. 
the prophet Samuel. Likely, although not 100% certain, likely not a good father, but at the very least, he was a man who took offenses personally, likely a guy that had thin skin. Easy to understand. Probably nobody in here likes to, uh, you know, likes to be criticized. The prophets. We don't know a lot about the prophets, but Jeremiah, for example, was a man who was oppressed and was a man of great sorrow, but there were some times when he took his sorrow way too far and God had to chastise him, basically saying, snap out of it, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Jonah, just talked about Jonah a little bit ago, a vindictive man who harbored anger and hatred toward the enemies of Israel. Amos was a simple farmer with no formal training. Habakkuk was a questioner and for a time didn't seem satisfied with the answers that he got from God. Guys, in short, when you read this list of the Hall of Faith, you are looking at a list full of men and women who are screw-ups. We really are. Look at the things that these men and women did. Now, I ask you a question, are we any different? You know, we do have this tendency, I think, to put men and women in, in the Bible on a pedestal and say that men like Abraham and David and Gideon and so on, these were just so much better men and they, they, they were just so closely in contact with God and boy, there's just no way that I could ever get to that level. You know, we sanitize their lives, we tend to, especially in our Sunday school classes. And frankly, I don't blame Sunday school teachers for sanitizing their lives because some of the things that these guys did are probably not appropriate to talk about with that age. But really, they weren't. These were sinful men just like we are, weren't they? And yet, what did God say about these people? Despite their sin, despite their rebellion, they still could be used by God. And in fact, they were used by God. Please turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, God did not choose the very great or the very top of the line to do what he wanted to do. You know what he did? God chose the mean and the lowly and the average, and he also chose sinners to do his work. I'd like to ask everyone here a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Just mull this in your own mind. Is there anyone in here who, when you're in high school, or maybe you are in high school right now, maybe you were voted top in your class in high school, whether in intelligence or whether you would uh, succeed or be best looking or nicest? Uh, is there anybody in here who has a college degree of any kind? Anybody in here who, has, uh, who would consider themselves to be upper middle class or wealthy or of a quote unquote high pedigree when it comes to how you dress or how you look? Maybe you take a lot of pride in your family lineage. If you fall into that category, I have great news for you this morning. You know what it is? God can use you also. There's good news for you. God can use you too. Because notice when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said that there were not many of you who were wise or influential. There were still some in the Corinthian church who were that way, and there are those today who are followers of Jesus Christ with high degrees or who are whatever. And I thank God for them. Don't get me wrong there. But the vast majority of the church in Corinth, just like the vast majority of the church in the world today, are filled with ordinary Joes. With ordinary average guys, as Joe Walsh once sang years ago. God uses ordinary Joes to do what he wants to have done. He uses what the world may consider to be lowly and worthless in order to demonstrate his love and his holiness towards others. In short, God uses sinners and screw-ups to do what he wants done. I mean, how can God use perfect people? There are no perfect people on this planet save Jesus who went to heaven 2,000 years ago. Guys, I don't know about you, but I find that to be awfully good news. I find that to be just... In, because who of us in here, myself included, who isn't a mess in somehow, somehow, some manner, who has been taken by God and made into a saint? Yes, we're imperfect saints, but the Bible still calls us saints. Unfortunately, the church has hijacked the word saint, I think, to mean something that it was never intended 
to me. The Catholic Church is probably most guilty of this, but I think that it's, we can be just as guilty in, in here or in any other church building. It's taken today to mean someone who's perfect and without fault. It puts people on a pedestal where, frankly, they don't deserve to be. But I want to ask you a question this morning. It, it, does that word really mean that? The word saint is not a word that is used to describe perfect people. The men and women that have been sainted by the Catholic Church are not men and women who are without sin, but you know, you don't get that impression anymore. Maybe at the time when they were alive you did, but not anymore. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but sometime check out Paul's description of the Corinthian church at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians and also the first couple of verses in 2 Corinthians. You know, the Corinthian church, like so many churches today, was rampant and blatant immorality was in it. There was a callous and casual attitude towards the worship of God. There was a ton of misinformation that was going on in the churches. There was rampant misuse and abuse of the gifts of God. At the end of 2 Corinthians, Paul said he was planning on coming to the church in order to straighten things out. And yet, when you read the introduction of both of those letters, Paul still calls them saints and sanctified ones. Not because of anything that they did, but because of what God had done for them through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many of you here are familiar with the, uh, the uh, country quartet, the Statler Brothers? Several of you in here are big fans of theirs. In one of my favorite songs, on one of my, on probably my favorite CD of theirs, uh, the name of the song that they sing is Have a Little Faith. It's about Abraham. The last verse of that song goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. The father of the faithful, the leader of the clan, he started out as just a simple country man. But God loved Abraham, and Abraham loved him. It's a story to remember when your faith is growing dim and you get tired and you say, oh, it was different back then, but remember that they were only just men. It's a lesson for the learning for the likes of you and me. Just have a little faith and you'll see. If a list of men with all of their screw-ups doesn't give you hope, then frankly, I don't really have a clue what will. It does for me. You know, there was one thing, though, that these men had in common. That these were men who trusted God and trusted his promises. Even if they did many things that we would consider to be abhorrent, and of course God would consider them abhorrent, they still trusted God. Now, of course, I'm not up here saying that we need to follow the example of men like Abraham and Isaac and Gideon and David. That's not what I'm saying. I think we are called to follow the example of one man and one man alone, and that, of course, is Christ Jesus. But let's not make the mistake that we may consider ourselves unqualified for his grace. Yes, granted, our sin separates us from God, and we should never take our sin lightly or in a joking manner. It is serious. But so was the sin of those who were listed in Hebrews chapter 11, but God didn't give up on them, did he? And let me tell you something, guys. God hasn't given up on any of us in here just yet. Amen. I don't know if there's a better word to use for that. If he didn't give up on them, why would he give up on you? Now, granted, if you make the deliberate decision to disown God and no longer follow him, then that's a whole different story. But that didn't happen with these men and women, and I'm, it doesn't have to happen with you. Martin Luther, the man who started the Reformation in the 1500s, once said that God creates out of nothing, therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing of him. As we get ready to sing our last song this morning, I'd like to ask us a question. How do we view ourselves? Do we have this tendency, like sadly I think a lot of American Christians do, that we just need to have a tweak here and there and we're A-OK, -okay. we just need to have a little tune-up and we're fine? I mean, we're really good people. I mean, I'll tell you what, that's why God loved us so much, because we're really good people. Well, that's not the case, guys. 
do, I think that we need to look at ourselves as people who need a complete overhaul and a complete rebuilding. But there's good news that God is in the, re, the, the rebuilding and the overhauling business. And he doesn't stop until the day of our death. He doesn't stop until the day of our death. I'll wrap up by just simply saying this, guys. Like I, as I've said probably about three times before, I don't know about you, but I find that to be terrific news. And I hope that you guys also. That we will lean on God and that we will lean on what Jesus Christ did for us in, the tra in transforming us. And it's a continual transformation. It's not a one-time shot. We're going to stumble and fall, but the good news is, is that Jesus is there ready to pick you up and to keep you moving forward.